Ah, so good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for joining online. We have an audience online and live. And, and this is beautiful. Uh, so, what a great worship it was, wasn't it? Also this new song, Sveti, Sveti, Sveti. You know, the holy, holy, holy. God Almighty, you know, we have a great God. And just imagine the moment, you know, when this all is over and we see him face to face and we bow down and we just worship the Trinity. Holy, holy, holy God Almighty. You know, the one who is set apart from this, you know, sin polluted world this is beautiful you know this is our future isn't it beautiful we have a good future those who believed in the cross those who received him as their redeemer and savior you know they are called the sons and daughters of god and we have a future you know we have a sure future in heaven that's a promise obechanie promise of god God promised, God gave us a promise. It's beautiful. And today, if you would turn with me into the book of Esther. Uh, because we have this great piece here. Okay, Esdra, Nehemiah, Esther. We'll be there soon. Short book with a great message. So today, uh, what's on the calendar today? What is on the calendar of God? You know, what is on our calendar today? Anybody knows? There is this Hebrew, Hebrew Jewish uh, holiday called Purim. Purim. And the Purim was established, as you read the book of Esther, at the end... Because God gave them great deliverance. That's why they celebrate these uh, this, uh, days of Purim. And this year, actually, it comes on, on this Sunday. You know, Saturday night, 27, and morning, 28. That's the Purim when it's celebrated. The 27th evening and the 28th morning. You know, so we can celebrate the Purim with the people of God, with the Jews, because we are also people of God. And uh, what is very interesting, this word Purim has this uh, Babylonian uh, uh, root. It's a Babylonian word. And you know what it means? It means a casting lot or throwing dice. You know, when you have a Sometimes you play a game and you have a dice, you know, and you throw the dice and there is one, six, you know. Uh, but in this sense, and we will go through this book of Esther today very quick because it speaks to us beautifully. And uh, when Haman, you know, we will learn about him, when he wanted to set a date... When, oh, when he will destroy the Israel and all the Jews, you know, in all this kingdom. He was choosing the date how he could destroy the Jews in this kingdom. Now, as we read in the book of Esther, I'll show you. Now, it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, which is Artaxas, it's another name for this king, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces. India, you know, like geography, where is the India, you know, we know. And all the way from India to Ethiopia, where is Ethiopia, which continent? Anybody? Africa. So he ruled from India, this like far east, far east, all the way through the Middle East, you know, the Arabian Peninsula, 
and all the way to Ethiopia, which is like this northern part of Africa. You know, huge empire. And what it speaks about, basically all the Jews lived within this territory. And Haman came with this idea that he will destroy the Jews. And because he wanted to destroy them, then he started to ask different gods. He started to ask demons. And we can see how he did it in the chapter 3, verse 4. Just uh, let me see. Uh, no, uh, verse 7. And in the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast poor, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar, which is this, you know, this is the end of February and beginning of March. That's exactly the day today when he planned to destroy the Jews. So very interesting, you know, the gambling, throwing dice, you know, reading the tarot cards, you know, divination, you know, listening for spirits, what they tell you, you know, meditation, you know, looking for some guidance, you know, the third eye, you know, should lead you, having a guru who leads you and all these things, you know, people are looking for this. Because as you see, behind every activity of a people is this, we could say, like invisible or even hidden spiritual power. Very interesting. And let's, let's look at this uh, shortly. So basically, I will say in few words the whole book of Esther, that we have a concept. I know you know it, but let's just repeat it. And then we look at a few verses. So the book of Esther is that these Jews are in this, uh, in this uh, uh, Persian captivity. I said Purim is a Babylonian word. It's Persian, basically. But Medo-Persian after Babylonian, you know, it's kind of mixed. But whatever, it's Persian Empire. And the Jews are under this influence, not having true freedom to worship being pretty much limited, very much limited. You know, maybe, maybe it's like us today, you know, restrictions, you know, not able to do many things that we used to be able. So the Jews are in, in, in captivity under this Persian empire. Uh, and during this time, uh, this king is making this big feast for all, all the princes and governors of these 127 27 provinces. So in, he invites all of them and makes a feast. At the end of the feast, he invites his queen Vashti because he wants to present her beauty to them. And queen Vashti refuses to come at the command of the king. And that's why, you know, they get a little bit scared. We read it later on. Uh, uh, verse 12, Queen Vashti refused. And in verse 20, the wise man from Persia and Medes, Medes, give king advice, you know, this should not happen. Because if she is not obeying the command of the king, then our wives will not obey our commands and there will be difficult times in the whole empire so at the advice of these wise men kings gets rid of the queen Vashti and he starts to look for new queen and that's why he invites all these you know uh, 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 beautiful virgins to his palace and they get special treatment and they are being presented before the king later on. And one of them is Hadassah, which is a Jewish girl. 
And we know her under the name Esther Yestira, you know, in Serbian Yestira. And she wins the heart of the king. She is at the palace. She becomes the queen. And then there is this Haman who hates Jews and he makes a plot, conspiracy. And he wants to annihilate the Jews, all of them in the whole empire. How many times in history somebody tried to do this? You know, and we can remember and just like think about it. You know, it's, it's the old song. It's nothing new. You know, let's blame the Jews because they keep these high positions. We, keep, we see it here, Mordecai has a high position. Esther has a high position. You know, all the Jews in, in, in nowadays are keeping the high positions. You know, let's hate the Jews. That, that's the concept of this book. But listen, there is something invisible behind this thinking. You know, that's not just, you know, we hate them because they are doing so well, because all these Rothschilds and, and others are Jews holding the banks, you know, together. You know, that, that's not the main point. We will see, there is, there is the devil himself behind this thinking. You know, there is a spiritual meaning in this. And then, uh, basically, Esther comes to the king and uh, reveals this plot of Haman. And at the end, the Jews are saved and the Haman is destroyed. Basically, simple story. Now, uh, I forgot the word... How do you call this stool? It's a piece of wood. It has a handle. It has this special wheel with the, with the tooth. And when you swing it, it makes this noise. You maybe know, know this tool. Duh. No, 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 no. Is it... Uh, I, ha I have it written in my phone, but now I cannot look at it. Uh, how was it? Crochet, trochet, something like this. You know, it's a piece of wood, which when you swing it, it makes a noise. You know, because there is a piece of wood which is touching the, the tooth on the wheel. Whatever, forget it. So, uh, the Jewish custom is that they read this book this morning. And every time the name Haman is mentioned... He is a bad guy, bad guy. You know, remember, Haman, bad guy. Just fix it in your thinking, bad guy, Haman. All the children, they start to make this noise, you know, because he's a bad guy. So we don't have this tool in our hands, but, but maybe when I say Haman, you can go and like, no, you know. Let's, let's act it, because we have to, Express it. He is a bad guy. Okay? So let's, let's do the first try. So when I say Haman, you do this noise, okay? So in this book, we have this bad guy, Haman. Ooh. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. You know, you can even, you know, step your feet. Because in this Jewish tradition, the old man, they start to step their feet. You know, they make a noise. And the children, you know, they're swinging this tool and everything gets noisy. You know, no, Haman, woo, bad guy, Haman, Haman, and you can even step your feet, you know, so give it to me back again, Haman, yeah, yeah, good, good, so let's, let's have it alive today, you know, this will be our church, so this is the story, we can see it here, so the book of Esther, chapter 2, uh, and in verse 10. So Esther is uh, called to be one of those virgins who go through the process of purification and they will be presented before the king. And verse 10, And Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it, meaning... Esther did not tell the king and the servants that she is from the tribe of the Jews, you know. 
she just did not expose this truth fully. And this is something what we will see in this book, that there are many things which are not revealed yet. Many things which are not revealed yet. Remember it. And now make, make a parallel connection with our life today. There are many things even in our life which are not revealed yet. Do you remember how the Bible says that we are the children of God and it's not seen yet? It's not revealed yet fully? Many people can come to you and they say, oh, oh, okay, you are a Christian, yeah, sure. Look at your life, you know. Look, and they don't understand. It's, it hasn't been revealed yet fully. We have a glimpse when we reveal it, you know. When we are spiritual and when we reflect God, there's this moment like, wow, you know. And these moments should be more and more in our life. You know, and we pray that we walk in the Spirit, that we reveal God. But it's not fully revealed yet. This world doesn't understand who we are yet. It's kind of hidden, invisible. But it's there and it's waiting for the time to be revealed. Do you know that the book of Esther has no mention of God at all? There is not mention the word God. There is not mention the name of God. It looks like it has nothing to do with God. Yet we will see that God is behind this all. And that's, that's the message of this book. You know, let's, let's go through it. So this has not been revealed yet who she is. And then uh, what happens... Uh, Verse 15, now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go into the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. Simply, Esther has no parents, you know, uh, she doesn't have a father, she doesn't have a mother. And Mordecai, her uncle, is the one who received her as a daughter. He's taking care of her. He adopted her. And she is in the process of being purified. Uh, and now her time came when she goes to be presented before the king, because the king is choosing, is about to choose a new queen. And it says here, and she required nothing but what Haggai, that's the one who was keeping the women for the king, appointed. This is very interesting. Imagine you are supposed to go before the king and present yourself. And you can take anything you want from the house of the women, from the riches. It's written there. It was the rule and the privilege of these ladies to take anything from the house of this pagan king and come with it and present yourself. You know, maybe, maybe a skin from a leopard, you know, and, and the golden belt and chains, you know, and, and the golden earrings and nose piece, you know, and uh, a belly piece, you know, belly button piece, you know, any... You can decorate yourself. And she says, you know, she chosen nothing but what was appointed. This is very interesting. You know, we have a call in our life. And God appoints something to us. And he says, this is your part. This is your part. And, you know, do we understand, do we treasure what God has given us that it's enough? Or are we looking for something, well, but I need also this and, and this. And, and if I would have this earpiece or this belly button piece, then I would present God better when I do soul winning. 
Or do I understand that what God has appointed for me, what God has given me, is completely enough? I am lacking nothing. And understand that they are in slavery. You know, they are under the oppression of the Persian king. She says, you know, what God has appointed, what God has set apart for me, that's enough. Maybe in this day and age, we can feel like under the oppression of the Persian king. We cannot do much, you know, we are limited. And maybe we may be whining, like, oh, I need this, and if only I had. You know what it is? Excuses. 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 I cannot love my wife because excuses. I cannot be faithful in my relationship. Excuses. What God has appointed is enough. It's enough. You don't need to take anything else from the world to be complete. We are complete in Him. We have enough for being godly in this wicked age, in this wicked world. What has been appointed is enough. It's beautiful. And you know, of course there is this, uh, there is this uh, principle like asking more. Second Kings 13 uh, uh, there is a command about shooting arrows and it says shoot arrows and the king took the bow and arrows and he, st he striked the earth thrice three times and it said if you would do it more you know I would destroy all your enemies from before you of course we are asking for more I don't mean this you know we are praying for people more you remember the story of, of uh, Genesis 18, Abraham praying for Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh God, per adventure, there is maybe 50 righteous. Would you save the city for 50? And we can pray and plead with God. That's okay. I don't mean, you know, we should know. This is perfect. We are asking for more. We are praying. But this is speaking about the principle of what God has given me as my share in all this. Am I, am I content and satisfied with my, my call, with my position? Do I understand that what God has appointed for me for this time and season, because tomorrow we may have different position, but now am I content in it? You know, I, I have to understand God and His his call and his leading and his purpose in order to be content. Because if I don't see it, if I, am, if I am not happy in what God has appointed for me, I will want more in this wrong sense. I remember like we as a young Bible school students, you know, sitting, you know, looking up in these great men of God. You know, Pastor John Love, Pastor Shibeli, you know, Pastor Scheller, Pastor Stevens, you know, preaching, you were sitting, you know. And there is a good desire in the heart. You know, maybe one day I could even preach also. It's good. But in humbleness we understand our position. Some people, they get rebellious. You know, I could do better. Oh, you can do better. And go and do better. But you don't have to do better than us, you know. You know, some people lose this honor. They are not satisfied with what's been appointed for them. I need more. I need more. You know, it's not enough for me to be evangelist. It's not enough for me to be a pastor of a church. I need to be a bishop of all the churches. You know, the last position. But no, you know, it's so precious, my part, what's been appointed for me. You know what's been appointed for me while I studied in Baltimore? I was cleaning the toilets, cleaning toilets. 
you know. And Mr. John, well, yeah, John Nielsen, he gave me these two sprays, blue and pink. Because blue is for one and pink is for another one, and you have to remember it. And then you clean it, you know. Who can remember what the blue and pink is for? So I mixed both of them together. <laughs> and it worked. It worked, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no. Doesn't the Bible says confess your sins one to another? So this this one is I'm confessing. No, you know, confessing sins one to another is face to face to the person, not before the church. So don't get it wrong. You know? uh, and I was happy cleaning the toilets. You know with whom? Pastor Adam Speedy. We were the crew. We were cleaning the toilets, cleaning the art room. We were cleaning the art room. Yeah. Great. Being happy in, in the part that God has given me. Uh, in Genesis 13, verse 9, there is Abraham and Lot. And they are about to separate. And you know what happens there? Lot lift, lifted up his eyes and saw the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah, how green it is, and he went. You know what Abraham did? And remember this. This, is, this, this verse is life saver in the, in the practicalities of life. Abraham said, Lot, listen, if you go left, I go right. And if you go right, I go left. Because I don't mind I don't mind. You know why? Because I know that what God has chosen for me, nobody will take away from me. God has appointed something for me. And if you do your little tricks and you go by side and you think that's the best, go ahead. I, I can go on the other side with God. I don't mind. Nobody will take what God has appointed for me. From me. You know, let's walk with God. God is faithful. Let's not go by sight. You know, many people go for the green plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know what? Let them have it. And then at the end, it's you who prays for them that they may be saved from the punishment. You remember? We mentioned, you know, Abraham praying for Lot and for the righteous in that city. You know, God has appointed something for us and that's enough and that's so satisfying when you know this is God now I'll show you simple you know it's very popular today to draw circles on on a, on a floor there's one circle two meters nothing another circle two meters nothing when you stand in a line you know but I don't mean this circle let's draw a circle that's what God appointed that's the call of God and now I can step out of the circle I'm very close to it. I'm not in it. I think I'm not even happy. Because I don't know where my place is. I'm not satisfied. I don't see any purpose in it. But once I step in and I know, wow, this is what God called me to. This is what God has appointed for me. This is his share with me. This is what he says. This is for you. Walk ye in it. I'm so happy. I have my place. I found my place. And I don't need anything from the world anymore. This is enough. What God has appointed. Because it's God given. God's given. God gave it. And then the story goes in a chapter 3 verse 4. Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him to Mordecai, that's the uncle of Esther. Yeah, 
I can hear somebody there. Ah, so good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for joining online. We have an audience online and live. And, and this is beautiful. So, what well, a great worship it was, wasn't it? Also this new song, Sveti, Sveti, Sveti. You know, the holy, holy, holy. God Almighty, you know, we have a great God. And just imagine the moment, you know, when this all is over. And we see him face to face. And we bow down. And we just worship the Trinity. Holy, holy, holy. God Almighty. You know, the one who is set apart from this, you know, sin-polluted world. This is beautiful. You know, this is our future. Isn't it beautiful? We have a good future. Those who believed in the cross, those who received him as their redeemer and savior, you know, they are call the sons and daughters of God, and we have a future, you know, we have a sure future in heaven, that's a promise, obechanie, promise of God, God promised, God gave us a promise, it's beautiful, and today, if you would turn with me into the book of Esther, uh, because we have this great peace here, Okay, Ezra and Nehemiah is there. We'll be there soon. Short book with a great message. So today, uh, what's on the calendar today? What is on the calendar of God? You know, what is on our calendar today? Anybody knows? There is this Hebrew, Hebrew Jewish uh, holiday called Purim. Purim. And the Purim was established, as you read the book of Esther, at the end, because God gave them great deliverance. That's why they celebrate this, uh, this uh, days of Purim. And this year, actually, it comes on, on this Sunday, you know, Saturday night, 27, and morning, 28. That's the Purim when it's celebrated. The 27th evening and the 28th morning, you know, so we can celebrate the Purim with the people of God, with the Jews, because we are also people of God. And uh, what is very interesting, this word Purim has this uh, Babylonian uh, uh, root. It's a Babylonian word. And you know what it means? It means... Uh, Casting lot or throwing dice. You know, when you have a sometimes you play a game and you have a dice, you know, and you throw the dice and there is one, six, you know. Uh, but in this sense, and we will go through this book of Esther today very quick because it speaks to us beautifully. And uh, when Haman, you know, we will learn about him, when he wanted to set a date, when, oh, when he will destroy the Israel and all the Jews, you know, in all this kingdom, he was choosing the date, how he could destroy the Jews in this kingdom. Now, as we read in the book of Esther, I'll show you. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, which is Artaxas, it's another name for this king, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces. India, you know, like geography, where is the India, you know, we know. And all the way from India to Ethiopia, where is Ethiopia, which continent? Anybody? Africa, 
So he ruled from India, this like far east, far east, all the way through the Middle East, you know, the Arabian Peninsula, and all the way to Ethiopia, which is like this northern part of Africa. You know, huge empire. And what it speaks about, basically all the Jews lived within this territory. And Haman came with this idea that he will destroy the Jews. And because he wanted to destroy them, then he started to ask different gods. He started to ask demons. And we can see how he did it in the chapter 3, verse 4. And just uh, let me see. Uh, no, uh, verse 7. And in the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day, and from month to month, to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar, which is this, you know, this is the end of February and beginning of March. That's exactly the day today when he planned to destroy the Jews. So very interesting, you know, the gambling, throwing dice, you know, reading the tarot cards, you know, divination, you know, listening for spirits, what they tell you, you know, meditation, you know, looking for some guidance, you know, the third eye, you know, should lead you, having a guru who leads you, and all these things, you know, people are looking for this. Because as you see, behind every activity of a people is this, we could say, like invisible or even hidden spiritual power. Very interesting. And let's, let's look at this uh, shortly. So basically, I will say in few words the whole book of Esther, that we have a concept. I know you know it, but let's just repeat it. And then we look at a few verses. So the book of Esther is that these Jews are in this, uh, in this uh, uh, Persian captivity. I said Purim is a Babylonian word. It's Persian, basically. But Medo-Persian after Babylonian, you know. It's kind of mixed, but whatever. It's Persian Empire, and the Jews are under this influence, not having true freedom to worship, being pretty much limited, very much limited. You know, maybe, maybe it's like us today, you know? Restrictions, you know, not able to do many things that we used to be able. So the Jews are in, in, in captivity under this Persian empire. Uh, and during this time, uh, this king is making this big feast for all, all the princes and governors of these 127 27 provinces. So in, he invites all of them and makes a feast. At the end of the feast, he invites his queen Vashti because he wants to present her beauty to them. And Queen Vashti refuses to come at the command of the king. And that's why, you know, they get a little bit scared. We read it later on. Uh, uh, verse 12, Queen Vashti refused. And in verse 20, the wise man from Persia and Medes, Medes, give king advice, you know, this should not happen. Because if she is not obeying the command of the king, then our wives will not obey our commands and there will be difficult times in the whole empire. So at the advice of these wise men, kings gets rid of the queen Vashti and he starts to look for new queen. And that's why he invites all these, you know, uh, 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 beautiful virgins to his palace. 
and they get special treatment and they are being presented before the king later on. And one of them is Hadassah, which is a Jewish girl, and we know her under the name Esther, Yestira, you know, in Serbian, Yestira. And she wins the heart of the king. She is at the palace. She becomes the queen. And then there is this Haman who hates Jews and he makes a plot, conspiracy. And he wants to annihilate the Jews, all of them in the whole empire. How many times in history somebody tried to do this? You know, when we can remember and just like think about it. You know, it's, it's the old song. It's nothing new. You know, let's blame the Jews because they keep these high positions. We, keep, we see it here, Mordecai has a high position. Esther has a high position. You know, all the Jews in, in, in nowadays are keeping the high positions. You know, let's hate the Jews. That, that's the concept of this book. But listen, there is something invisible behind this thinking. You know, that's not just, you know, we hate them because they are doing so well, because all these Rothschilds and, and others are Jews holding the banks, you know, together. You know, that, that's not the main point. We will see there is, there is the devil himself behind this thinking. You know, there is a spiritual meaning in this. And then, uh, basically, Esther comes to the king and uh, reveals this plot of Haman. And at the end, the Jews are saved and the Haman is destroyed. Basically, simple story. Now, uh, I forgot the word. How do you call this stool? It's a piece of wood. It has a handle. It has this special wheel with the, with the tooth. And when you swing it, it makes this noise. You maybe know, know this tool. Duh. No, 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 no. Is it... Uh, I, ha I have it written in my phone, but now I cannot look at it. Uh, how was it? Crochet? Trochet? Something like this. You know, it's a piece of wood, which when you swing it, it makes a noise. You know, because there is a piece of wood which is touching the, the tooth on the wheel. Whatever, forget it. So, uh, the Jewish custom is that they read this book this morning. And every time the name Haman is mentioned, he is a bad guy, bad guy. You know, remember, Haman, bad guy. Just fix it in your thinking, bad guy, Haman. All the children... They start to make this noise, you know, because he's a bad guy. So we don't have this tool in our hands, but, but maybe when I say Haman, you can go and like, no, you know, let's, let's act it because we have to express it. He is a bad guy. Okay. So let's, let's do the first try. So when I say Haman, you do this noise. Okay. So in this book, we have this bad guy, Haman. Yeah, perfect, yeah. You know, you can even, you know, step your feet. Because in this Jewish tradition, the old men, they start to step their feet. You know, they make a noise, and the children, you know, they're swinging this tool, and everything gets noisy. You know, no, Haman, woo, bad guy, Haman. Haman. And you can even step your feet, you know, so give it to me back again. Haman. Yeah, yeah, good, good. So let's let's have it alive today, you know. This will be our church. So this is the story. We can see it here. So the book of Esther, chapter 2, uh, and in verse 10. So Esther is uh, called to be one of those virgins who go through the process of purification and they will be presented before the king. And verse 10, And Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, 
for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it, meaning Esther did not tell the king and the servants that she is from the tribe of the Jews. You know, uh, she just did not expose this truth fully. And this is something what we will see in this book, that there are many things which are not revealed yet. Many things which are not revealed yet. Remember it. And now make a, make a parallel connection with our life today. There are many things even in our life which are not revealed yet. Do you remember how the Bible says that we are the children of God and it's not seen yet? It's not revealed yet fully? Many people can come to you and they say, oh, oh, okay, you are a Christian, yeah, sure. Look at your life, you know. Look, and they don't understand. It's, it hasn't been revealed yet fully. We have a glimpse when we reveal it, you know. When we are spiritual and then we reflect God, there's this moment like, wow. You know, and these moments should be more and more in our life. You know, and we pray that we walk in the Spirit, that we reveal God. But it's not fully revealed yet. This world doesn't understand who we are yet. It's kind of hidden, invisible. But it's there and it's waiting for the time to be revealed. Do you know that the book of Esther has no mention of God at all? There is not mention the word God. There is not mention the name of God. It looks like it has nothing to do with God. Yet we will see that God is behind this all. And that's, that's the message of this book. You know, let's, let's go through it. So this has not been revealed yet who she is. And then uh, what happens... Uh, Verse 15, now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go into the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. Simply, Esther has no parents, you know, uh, she doesn't have a father, she doesn't have a mother. And Mordecai, her uncle, is the one who received her as a daughter. He's taking care of her. He adopted her. And she is in the process of being purified. Uh, and now her time came when she goes to be presented before the king, because the king is choosing, is about to choose a new queen. And it says here, and she required nothing but what Haggai, that's the one who was keeping the women for the king, appointed. This is very interesting. Imagine you are supposed to go before the king and present yourself. And you can take anything you want from the house of the women, from the riches. It's written there. It was the rule and the privilege of these ladies to take anything from the house of this pagan king and come with it and present yourself. You know, maybe, maybe a skin from a leopard, you know, and, and the golden belt and chains, you know, and, and the golden earrings and nose piece, you know, and... Uh, a belly piece, you know, belly button piece, you know, and he, he, you can decorate yourself. And she says, you know, she chosen nothing but what was appointed. This is very interesting, you know, we have a call in our life. And God appoints something to us. And he says, this is your part. This is your part. And, you know, do we understand, do we treasure what God has given us, that it's enough? 
Or are we looking for something, well, but I need also this and, and this, and, and if I would have this earpiece or this belly button piece, then I would present God better when I do soul winning. Or do I understand that what God has appointed for me, what God has given me, is completely enough? I am lacking nothing. And understand that they are in slavery. You know, they are under the oppression of the Persian king. And she says, you know, what God has appointed, what God has set apart for me, that's enough. Maybe in this day and age, we can feel like under the oppression of the Persian king. We cannot do much, you know, we are limited. And maybe we may be whining, like, oh, I need this, and if only I had. You know what it is? Excuses, excuses, excuses. I cannot love my wife because excuses. I cannot be faithful in my relationship. Excuses. What God has appointed is enough. It's enough. You don't need to take anything else from the world to be complete. We are complete in Him. We have enough for being godly in this wicked age, in this wicked world. What has been appointed is enough. It's beautiful. And you know, of course, there is this, uh, there is this uh, principle like asking more. Second Kings thirteen. Uh, uh, there is a command about shooting arrows, and it says shoot arrows. And the king took the bow and arrows, and he he striked the earth thrice, three times. And it said, if you would do it more. You know, I will destroy all your enemies from before you. Of course, we are asking for more. I don't mean this, you know. We are praying for people more. You remember the story of, of uh, Genesis 18. Abraham praying for Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh God, per adventure, there is maybe 50 righteous. Would you save the city for 50? And we can pray and plead with God. That's okay. I don't mean, you know, we should know. This is perfect. We are asking for more. We are praying. But this is speaking about the principle of what God has given me as my share in all this. Am I, am I content and satisfied with my, my call, with my position? Do I understand that what God has appointed for me for this time and season, because tomorrow we may have different position, but now am I content in it? You know, I, I have to understand God and his, his call and his leading and his purpose in order to be content. Because if I don't see it, if I am, if I am not happy in what God has appointed for me, I will want more. In this wrong sense. I remember like we as a young Bible school students, you know, sitting, you know, looking up in these great men of God. You know, Pastor John Love, Pastor Shibeli, you know, Pastor Scheller, Pastor Stevens, you know, preaching, we were sitting, you know. And there is a good desire in the heart. You know, maybe one day I could even preach also. It's good. But in humbleness, we understand our position. Some people, they get rebellious. You know, I could do better. Oh, you can do better. And go and do better. But you don't have to do better than us, you know. You know, some people lose this honor. They are not satisfied with what's been appointed for them. I need more. I need more. You know, it's not enough for me to be evangelist. It's not enough for me to be a pastor of a church. I need to be a bishop of all the churches. You know, the last position. But no, 
You know, it's so precious. My part, what's been appointed for me. You know what's been appointed for me while I studied in Baltimore? I was cleaning the toilets. Cleaning toilets! You know? And Mr. John, yeah, John Nielsen, he gave me these two sprays, blue and pink. Because blue is for one and pink is for another one. And you have to remember it. And then you clean it, you know? Who can remember what the blue and pink is for? So I mixed both of them together. <laughs> and it worked. It worked. You know? Yeah. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. Confess your sins one to another. So this, this one is... I'm confessing. No. You know, confessing sins one to another is face to face to the person. Not before the church. So don't get it wrong. Uh, and I was happy cleaning the toilets. You know with whom? Pastor Adam Speedy. We were the crew. We were cleaning the toilets, cleaning the art room. We were cleaning the art room. Yeah. Great. Being happy in, in the part that God has given me. Uh, in Genesis 13, verse 9, there is Abraham and Lot. And they are about to separate. And you know what happens there? Lot lift, lifted up his eyes and saw the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah, how green it is, and he went. You know what Abraham did? And remember this. This, is, this, this verse is life saver in the, in the practicalities of life. Abraham said, Lot, listen, if you go left, I go right. And if you go right, I go left. Because I don't mind. I don't mind. And you know why? Because I know that what God has chosen for me, nobody will take away from me. God has appointed something for me. And if you do your little tricks, and you go by side, and you think that's the best, go ahead. I, I can go on the other side with God. I don't mind. Nobody will take what God has appointed for me. From me. You know, let's walk with God. God is faithful. Let's not go by sight. You know, many people go for the green plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know what? Let them have it. And then at the end, it's you who prays for them that they may be saved from the punishment. You remember? We mentioned, you know, Abraham praying for Lot and for the righteous in that city. You know, God has appointed something for us. And that's enough. And that's so satisfying when you know this is God. Now, I'll show you simple, you know. It's very popular today to draw circles on, on, a, on a floor. There's one circle, two meters nothing. Another circle, two meters nothing when you stand in a line, you know. But I don't mean this circle. Let's draw a circle. That's what God appointed. That's the call of God. And now I can step out of the circle. I'm very close to it. I'm not in it. I think I'm not even happy. Because I don't know where my place is. I'm not satisfied. I don't see any purpose in it. But once I step in, and I know, wow, wow, this is what God called me to. This is what God has appointed for me. This is his share with me. This is what he says. This is for you. Walk ye in it. I'm so happy. I have my place. I found my place. And I don't need anything from the world anymore. This is enough. What God has appointed. Because it's God given. God's given. God gave it. And then the story goes in a chapter 3, verse 4. Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him to Mordecai, that's the uncle of Esther, Yestira, he 
He hearkened not unto them to bow before Haman. Ooh. Yeah, the Mordecai didn't want to bow before Haman. Ooh. You know Haman whom he represents? You know what is... I'll, I'll read it to you now. Because maybe then you will get even more angry about him. This Haman. Oh, Haman. Where do we have it? Where do we have it? Let me see. It says here the Haman, the enemy of the Jews. I just lost it. I know it's somewhere here. We will get into it later. Don't worry. But the Haman is called in this book as the enemy of the Jews and he is a murderer. He just wants to destroy them here. Uh, Esther 3 verse 10. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamedatha the Agagite, the Jews' enemy. The enemy of the Jews. So, Haman is the enemy of the Jews. Haman. Yeah, you are amazing. You are amazing. You know, let's remember it. It's very important. Because then when this Haman comes into your life with some business, with some offer, you will know immediately, no, he is the boo guy. I, oh, no. He is a murderer. He wants to kill not one, but all the Jews, including old and young and women and children, all of them. Very serious man. A very evil man. So here we have it. Uh, so then... Uh, Chapter 3, verse 4, it says that Mordecai revealed he is a Jew. So now the time comes, you know, when these hidden things are revealed. Even in our life. You know, suddenly God re will reveal something about you to others. Many times we spoke about this practically. You are at the working place. There is a Christmas party. You know, and they start to drink and celebrate. And you are like, no, no, no. What happened? And then it's revealed that you are different. Because we are different than others. It says here, chapter 3, verse 8. And Haman, his very bad guy, Haman, yeah, said unto king, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all the people. Neither keep they the king's laws. You know, these people are different. That's us. We are completely different than this world. And we do not run as this world. And everybody sees it and that bothers them. It bothers them that you are so pure. Because this world is dirty. And you are pure. Because you are washed by the blood. Because we are washed we are pure, but the world remains dirty. But we are pure. We are different. We don't run as this world. We are different. And they see it. They see it more and more. Maybe it was hidden in the beginning, but now it's being revealed that we are different. And that's what the Haman, the evil one, sees. And that bothers him. So then, what happens here? Verse 13. 
So he asks king for permission to destroy these people, verse 13, and the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, kill, and to cause, perish all Jews, both young and old and little children and women, in one day upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Uh, here it is. You know what he asks for? He sends out the letters that they can destroy, kill, and cause to perish or steal. Oh, haven't we heard these words? To kill, to steal, and to destroy. Who says it? You know, we have it here. In the John 10, 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. Let's read it. Pastor Stevens used to say, I could quote it for you, but I'll read it. Well, I can say I cannot quote it for you. That's why I read it. Now, John 10, 10. The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Isn't this shocking? The exactly same words. Haman, the bad guy, Haman, ooh, wants to kill, steal, and destroy. That's the devil himself. There is a certain spirit behind him, which is being revealed by Jesus in John 10. 10. To steal, to kill, and destroy. But I am come that they might have life, and they have it. They might have it more abundantly. Now, chapter four, verse seven. You know, Mordecai speaks now uh, to the servant of Esther because he's asking her to enter before the king and plead for her people. And he speaks about that there is, a, there is also promise to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. There was a big lump of money. It's mentioned there that Haman, the bad guy, Haman, woo, offers the king and he says, I will give you this money and let me destroy the Jews. You know, many times people think it's all about the money. You know, the, and we just parallel, you know, don't get me so precisely, but the vaccination, the masks, the restrictions, you know, this rule, it's all about the money. They are making such a huge money on it. But listen, it has a two levels. That's not only about the money. The, let's not be so simple and blind because there is a spirit behind. It's against Christ. It's against the people of God. It's about destroying the people of God that the Christ should not come. That's what's behind, not the money. Don't think that this was going on nowadays in the governments and the world is all about the money and then the rich will get more rich. Well, they will, but it's not about it. It's about the devil behind them. That's why they do it. There is a spirit who came to steal, kill, and destroy. Nothing changed from the old times. It's the same here today. And then, in chapter 4, Verse 10 to 16, basically, there is this story when uh, Mordecai says to Esther, you should come in front of the king and plead for the people. And she says in verse 11, this is not allowed to enter into king's presence uninvited. And there is a law, anybody who comes uninvited, he will be sentenced to death. You know what she says in her words? I'm afraid. Maybe I'll die. I can't go there. Mordecai, don't ask me this. I don't want to risk my life. I'm afraid. Are you afraid to go on the street and preach Christ? I am. I'm also afraid. 
I'll be destroyed by people's looks and comments. I'm afraid. Me too. We all are. Isn't this beautiful? That Esther, this heroic woman, is afraid. She is this fragile lady like us. You know, like, you know, the Superman and superheroes, and there is this uh, Aquaman and Superman and Burger Man and Banana Man, and you have all these superheroes with superpowers. There is Esther, she has no powers. She's just happy in her part God gave her, and she does it. She's afraid. I don't know what will be tomorrow. I don't know what's the cost of my obedience to God. I have no idea. I'm afraid. That's maybe many people don't follow God because they are afraid that they will fail. They will not do enough. They will not do good. Or they are not brave. We are not neither. We are just simple afraid. And Mordecai is Mordecai, the one who gives her advice. And we could see him as a scripture in our life. He tells her, you know what? Just go. Just go. Because he says here these beautiful words. words these beautiful verses. Verse 13. Think not with yourself that you shall escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Meaning, when they start to kill all the Jews, you will be killed also. And then he says... Don't hold your peace at this time, at this time, this evil time, when we are being oppressed and when we are afraid of the king. Don't hold your peace. Don't keep quiet, but speak. Pastor Marcek mentioned this beautiful thing, you know. It's not a scripture, but great idea. He said, don't turn off the lighthouse when the storm comes, Right? The lighthouse is there for the storm. And the scripture, the Mordecai says, don't hold your peace. Don't keep quiet. You will not escape. And he says further, you know, the salvation, the enlargement and deliverance will arise to the Jews from another place if you don't do it. You know, God will take care of his people. God will take care of his business and his plans. Don't worry. But you will have no part in it. You will have no part in it. You just step out of the circle. And you keep quiet. And you think you are happy. And you are miserable. You are so miserable. I've seen these people. They call themselves Christians. And they are so miserable. Because they don't want to stand in a circle. They don't want to be in a part that God appointed to them. Because they're afraid. And we too. But the simple is, let's listen to Mordecai and his encouragement. Let's listen to the word of God which says, don't be afraid. Just do it. And he says, he adds even, still verse 14. And who knows? Whether you are come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe God put you here for this time. He put you here. Not somebody else. Oh, oh God. Maybe, maybe if, if, if Pastor Tomasz is here, then we could. Or if, if some great missionary, you know, Caroline or Pastor Shibeli is here, he could. No, 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 no. You you. God put you now in this time. You and now. Me and now? I'm not ready. I'm afraid. I haven't even finished my Bible school yet. And by the way, that's true. But, but I'll explain you some, some other time. You know, it's very difficult. I'm afraid. I finished Bible school. I have Degree. I wrote a letter to, uh, to Pastor Glenn Cannon and uh, Pastor Hadley and I know who else was there and they granted it to me. Yeah. I'm afraid. I'm not ready. I'm not done completely yet, God. 
And Mordecai says, now and you. It's you and now. Oh, really, God? Really? And I don't need anything more? This is enough? I should be satisfied with this portion? This is enough? I thought if I know more and if I have more power and more faith, then I could do it. God says, this is enough now. You. Oh. And you know what she says? Okay, if I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. Okay, I'll do. I'll obey. You know, at all cost. At all cost. When this book says do it, then do it at all cost. And if you die, then you die. So what? This is the time. This is the call. It's you and now. And if you, if you perish, then what? You perish. God is behind this all. And this is what this book is about. Nobody sees God. Nobody can see him. Nobody can feel him. It's like he's not in the story at all. He's not mentioned once. And yet he is behind it all. Those moments when you don't see him in your life, when you don't feel him, sight, senses, faith. You know he is there. Because the scripture says it. You don't need to feel him. You don't need to see him. You don't need to feel his presence with the goosebumps, you know. How many times I heard people, well, God was there. How do you know? Well, I had these goosebumps. Really? Maybe there is a time when you will not see him, you will not feel him, you will be afraid, you will think you have not enough. And God will say, this is the time, it's you, and you have everything. And God, I'm afraid, what if I die? So what? Do you believe me or not? That's the point. And then it continues. And it says here. In verse 16. Then Esther says. Go gather all the Jews. That are present at Shushan. The city and the palace. Of Persian empire. And, and make them fast for me. They neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. This is the point. I don't have it in me. I can't do it out of myself. I need to turn to God. And I need the help of others. Pray for me. Fast for me. Please. Don't eat and don't drink for me. Please. Because we are facing the king with a request. Salvation of people is at the stake. Tomorrow, the bad guy, Haman, ooh, wants to kill them. You know how many people will die today and tomorrow by the hand of Haman, the devil, who came to steal and kill and destroy John 10.10? 10? Let's fast and pray. And we can enter into his presence. That the permission is granted to us that we can save them. Is there any difference between the Jews of those days and the unbelievers now? When we read it, we say, oh, I would, I would do this, Esther. I would pray and fast that the Jews are saved. Well, do we pray and fast that they are saved? And we do. I know we do. Here and there, I'm just pointing out that there is nothing we can do from ourselves. Where the power comes from? From Him, when we turn to Him. I'm weak, I'm fragile, I'm afraid. I don't know if I even want to do it. It can cost me my life. I'm not even ready enough. But God says, you have everything. It's you, it's now. And when you turn to me, I'll do it. And maybe you don't see me and you don't feel me in this moment. Maybe it looks like I'm not in the story at all. But he is behind this all. And the demons and the evil Haman, he is casting the dice and lots and he is whispering with the demons, looking into future, when to do it. 
He has a scheme and plans. The devil has a plans. But God is behind this all just laughing. <laughs> In a Psalm 2, God laughs at them. Because they, they think they make plans against God, against his anointed. But God laughs at them. God has it under control in your life and in my life. God has everything under control. God is in it. Let's just pray and trust him. And God will beautifully do it. And then it says here, uh, in verse 7, uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 9, 9, 7, 9, then it goes the way that Haman is hanged. Haman was trying to hang Mordecai, the Esther's uncle, but it turned the way around that he is hanged himself. So this story is over with him. And then chapter 8, verse 8, it says, that the Jews are saved. You know, it says, Write also for the Jews in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring. King make decision. For the writing is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring that may no man reverse. You know, the salvation of the Jews is sealed. We are also sealed by the king's decision and no man can reverse it. They are saved. We are saved. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. No man can reverse it. And then even it goes further and in verse 17 at the end, and many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. So many of these Persians, Gentiles, you know, the devil worshippers, the fallen angels worshippers, Luciferian era, you know, look at the Babylon, what they used to worship, four-winged creatures, cherubim, the fallen cherubims, and they, are, they turned, they become Jews. They believed. You know, they believed. This is amazing. They believed. Many, many believed. Now is the time. Now we can pray for people. We can fast. And maybe we think we don't have enough. But God is in it. God can do it and he will. Maybe many things are hidden. Maybe they don't even know we are Christians. Now is the time to reveal it. Mordecai says, reveal it, tell it, go to king, pray, you have your part, do it. You, now, God. Write it down. You, now, God. And Haman, the bad guy, ooh, he can make his schemes and plans, he can invoke demons. God is behind it and he will reverse it. God is in this plan. God is in this business no matter how it looks you know god has a victory so let's just be bold in this you know in this time you now god that's that's the principle for us god bless you thank you amen amen wow so now uh, let's